is I want to talk about a biblical term that I've talked about before, and that's the word Selah. So the word Selah can be found in the Bible about 74 times. It's 71 times in the book of Psalms and three in the book of Habakkuk, and it's always in reference to a song. In my opinion, one of the greatest disappointments in the musical world is that the invention of musical notation did not happen until the year 1025. So up until that point, lyrics would have little notes scribbled on them about how to play or sing them. The earliest copy of anything remotely like that is a Babylonian tablet that was discovered in 1400 BC. And if you look that up, you can Google it and it'll come right up. It says, scholars agree, that it says how to tune your lyre, which was like a little harp thing, a little guitar, um, and that you were supposed to play it in a certain uh, scale, which might mean nothing to you guys, but it's a way that the song would have sounded. Um, but largely, songs were passed down um, up until that point. They were passed down as we passed down lullabies or folk songs or bluegrass music. There's something I didn't know. Uh, it's all by ear, so they don't write those down. And since several centuries have passed since the writing of the Psalms, it's no wonder that some of the words referring to how the music was to be played remain untranslated. We simply don't have enough evidence to say with full confidence what the word may mean. However, based on biblical and historical evidence collected over the centuries, we have a pretty good guess. So scholars agree that the term Selah is a musical one, and it was used to mark a pause in the singing of the lyrics. That pause could possibly be for pausing and reflecting on words of the song while listening for God to speak through it, a breath mark for the singer, or a musical interlude. We at Coastal observe something similar today, although we don't outrightly call it Selah. Oftentimes at the end of a sermon, our pastors will call for a time of reflection set to music. This is very much like a Selah. We take a moment before we leave the church to resume our busy schedules, to pause and think about what has been talked about and how we should respond to the sermon. Maybe we need to repent of something and ask for God's forgiveness. Maybe we need to invite the Holy Spirit to sift through our hearts and reveal the areas where he's asking us to grow. Maybe we need to thank the Lord for the timely word that brought encouragement to our hearts. What Selah in the Psalms is intended to do is exactly that. But how often do we sit down for our devotional reading and blow right over that word Selah because we don't quite understand it and we don't know why it's there? A couple of years ago, I read a book that was written to shed some light on some of the spiritual disciplines Christians observe and why they are important to our faith. I was fascinated by the spiritual discipline of solitude or quiet before the Lord. And the point of it is solely for seeking him and listening to him. I grew up in an Assemblies of God church. I spent a couple of years as in a Mennonite denomination, which was a lot of fun. And then I spent a couple years in an evangelical free denomination, which was also a lot of fun and a growing experience for me before I found myself here. But the idea of just sitting, reflecting, and listening, totally new to me. That had not been communicated to me through my churches, through, believe it or not, my Bible school. It just wasn't a discipline that was taught or at least stressed, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. So this book I was reading convinced me to try it, so I decided to try something new, and I started to. And the Lord showed me why it was important right off the bat. So that week I had been reading in the book of Matthew, and I read the story of chapter in chapter 18 where Peter goes up to the Lord and he says, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? And the Lord replies, 70 times, seven times. Everyone know where I am? Um, and then he tells him a parable of a king and um, his, his slaves and how he had pardoned the one and had great mercy on him. And then that person went and like, you know, beat up his brother and said, give me what you owe me. And you know the story of men. Okay, cool. So <laughs> I'm not going to act it out for you. So two days later, I read that story. Two days later, I was doing my best to sit quietly be before the Lord because I don't know if you guys have this problem. Um, I can't sit quietly before the Lord without my brain just, you know what I mean? It's just going to like 
what am I going to do in the next five minutes? Oh, man, Declan needs to get picked up from school, and I need to make sure I'm there on time. Anybody else struggle with that? It's so hard to do. (laughs) Sitting in solitude before the Lord, the reason why it's called a discipline is because you literally have to practice doing it to get any good at it. Because, like, when you you take your first stab at it, it's just so challenging. Um, So, um, sorry, I forgot where I was. (laughs) So I had been doing this. I had been trying. So two days later, I was trying. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And that surprised me. Not that it should, but it did. And the Holy Spirit spoke and said, you know, Brooke, there's a person in your family. I just won't say who because I'm just not going to. person in your family that you are holding resentment and unforgiveness towards. And I need you to let that go, repent, and ask for forgiveness. And it totally stunned me for two reasons. Well, one reason. Mainly that two, re- two days before I had been reading that story in Matthew, which is the word of the Lord in my devotional time, and I didn't catch that. It didn't jump out at me. And I think the reason why is because I hadn't stopped to listen. I hadn't taken time to reflect on what I read. I just blew through the passage thinking, check mark, I did my devotional reading for the day. I can move on to my next thing. But sitting before the Lord and seeking him and pausing to reflect has such spiritual value in our lives. And it allowed the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak to me in an area that I just wasn't listening to him in. So I began realizing that the spiritual discipline of pausing and listening is Selah. That's what it is. So tonight I would like to lead us in a corporate observance of Selah in Psalm 46. Um, Christina, can you come up? So we are going to read in the Amplified Version, and this is what we're going to do. I'm going to play piano, and Christina is going to read the psalm to you guys. We're going to have the words of the psalm up here on the screen. And how I wish I had the original music, how um, this was notated all those years ago, because we would totally sing it for you. But of course, that was lost, so we don't have that. So we're going to settle for poetry set to music. And when we get to the part of the psalm that says Selah, we're going to pause for a few moments, about 30 seconds to a minute, And I want each of you just to do a couple of things. You can ponder the portion of scripture. Maybe something jumped out at you. Maybe the Lord's nudging you in a certain area. Just ponder that and reflect. Remain silent before him. Invite him to speak to you. And then we will move on to the next stanza. So there are three stanzas, three stanzas that we will observe. And before we begin, I also just want to call your attention to the fact that tonight, as a part of our True North teaching series, we're going to be talking about pluralism in our culture. And note, as we read this psalm, the spots where God calls us to recognize who he is in relation to what's going on around us. God is our refuge and strength, mighty and impenetrable to temptation, a very present and well-proved help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains be shaken into the midst of the seas, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling and tumult. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her right early, at dawn of the morning. The nations raged, the kingdoms tottered and were moved. He uttered his voice. 
the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, our fortress and high tower. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations and wonders in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow into pieces and snaps the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. Let be and be still and know, recognize and understand that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, our high tower 